We're all set. And welcome to worship. And let us begin with our prelude. Joanne. Just a few announcements to bring to your attention. Reminder about uh, my home office and my new virtual office hours. The uh, link was in the bulletin if you're interested in joining me. Our church YouTube channel is still active. The minute for mission was in the bulletin, and if you uh, didn't see it there, you can access it on the website through the bulletin. And uh, at our recent regional meeting, there were some recommended readings from our um, elder teaching from our indigenous elder. And uh, there was a request to have that list provided. It was in the bulletin this week as well, and uh, you can access that through the website if you didn't see it. Our something new, I'm calling it WOW, Wednesday Outdoor Worship. And we're hoping to start this Wednesday. We are starting by giving um, a call to those who haven't been able to join us on Zoom. And uh, as space allows, we will expand to others who are interested. You will have to bring your own chair and wear a mask because we're going to do some singing. And although we're outside, singing is more forceful and we need to be a little more careful. Um, if you are wanting to be involved, please just email or call the church office before 10 a.m. on Mondays. And uh, as spaces are available, first come, first serve. We'll let you know. Reminder, if you haven't already ordered for the summer salad supper, our drive-through supper, it's on the 23rd, but you need to order by this Wednesday, the 16th. Um, it says by 8 p.m., so as soon as you get home from worship, if you happen to be here, that'll be the deadline. And you can call Susan or email Heather about that. Uh, I know that we've had quite a few orders already, so thank you to those who have already ordered. Um, and uh, let everyone know that you know about that, and we uh, would welcome anyone who'd like to join us. As well, our next fun script is the last until fall, so if you, now that the stores are starting to open and you'd like to do a little shopping, perhaps get a gift card first and then go shopping. Uh, ordering this Friday and picking up next Friday. So um, keep that in mind. If you need a um, 
order form. They are on the website, but there are also a few hard copies out at the Emily Street door. And as always, we thank you for continuing your givings and uh, making sure that we continue to give our ministry in this community. And uh, there was a little note just to remind you that the hall build is on hold for now. So you can move your donations to general operating funds or you can continue to give to the build. Uh, that money will be invested until such time as we need it. Any changes you'd like to make if you're on par or um, doing other things like that, please just speak to Lorna, our treasurer. And those are our announcements for today. So as we light the candle, we know that light is all around us. The sun's coming up ever earlier each morning. There's more light this time of year than any other. And the flame of the Christ candle echoes the light that comes at the rising and leaves at the setting of our sun each day and in varying colors and intensities. The light bounces off the water and filters through the trees. Light nurtures our plants, our animals, and us. It fills us with energy and life. The flame of the Christ candle continues to shine in and through us. to worship. Welcome to worship, a time to glorify God. Although apart, we are united in our praise and thanksgiving. Welcome to God's peace, a time to open ourselves to God's healing power. We come to move beyond our doubts, fears, and distractions. Welcome to God's love, a time to experience God's inclusive welcome. We come to receive God's love, which lifts the shadows and brings us light and joy. Welcome. Let us pray. Loving God, as the sun and wind filter through the trees, so your spirit filters through our lives. You stir us to movement. You warm us. Your spirit gives us courage and strength for life, no matter what comes. Renew that spirit in this time of worship, we pray. Amen. And our hymn of praise is four verses from New Every Morning.
comes from the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. And it tells us a story that although Saul has had some great military victories, he's also lost favor with the God who chose him to be king. And so now God, through the prophet Samuel, identifies the successor to Saul. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came out to meet him with trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse had Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Let us sing, Spirit of the Living God.
jewelry box this morning. I had to go really looking for this this week. I have my ball glove and a softball. Now, you might wonder what a ball glove and a softball have to do much with the scriptures or church. Although I do know a lot of churches that have ball teams, or used to. But when I was younger, this is my ball glove, I'm pretty sure. I don't think I took Stevens. It's in our cupboard, too. When I was younger, about grade six or so, we had a softball team. Now, um, those of you who might know me know I'm not particularly, uh, what's the word, athletic. I'm not particularly good at running and jumping and all of those things. I skated when I was younger, but other than that, I didn't do a whole lot of sports. But for some reason, in grade six, I decided I should be on the softball team. And a lot of people in my class felt I shouldn't, because I couldn't run as fast as most people. And I didn't have a really, really strong arm, but the teacher was the one who made the decisions. The teacher made me the catcher of our softball team. And people kind of wondered, you know, she's not the best hitter and the best runner around the bases and things. Why on earth would the teacher make her our catcher? Well, I could catch quite well, so that was helpful. But I also had the ability to figure out where people were going to go. So I was ready to throw the ball when I had it. If somebody was trying to steal a base. And I was pretty accurate when I could throw it. And the teacher just sensed that I would know where that ball was going or where that ball should be going. And I would do the job. So the teacher made me the catcher. It's the first and only time I've ever been on a softball team that got chosen like that. Later, when I was older, a young mom got together with other young moms and we played on a slow pitch team. Again, I got made the catcher because I could do that job well. But to look at me, nobody thought of me as a softball player. But the people, especially that teacher in grade six, saw something different. They saw in me something that would make me good at part of that game. That's what happens with God. That's what happens in this story with David becoming king. All of his brothers are older. Apparently his oldest brother, the one you would think of should be chosen king, looked good. Probably the crown would have looked great on him. But God saw something in David that would make him a better king than all of his brothers. Because God looked inside to see what it was in David's heart, in David's spirit. And once David was chosen, the spirit came and rested upon him, which allowed David to become probably the greatest king that Israel ever had. Because God doesn't look at people the way we look at people. We tend to look at people and decide whether they're athletic or smart or whether they'll be good at this or that thing just by looking. But God doesn't just look on the outside. God looks on the inside. And on the inside are things we could never imagine. And so we are thankful that God takes that time to look inside our hearts to help us grow into the people that God thinks we should be, the people that God has called us to be. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we have some special music, As the Deer Pants, by Karen and Janet. Thank you to Karen and Janet for that. Their voices blend so beautifully together. Our responsive psalm is Psalm 20 this morning. May God answer you in the day of trouble and the name of God defend you. May God send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from the holy mountain. May God remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May God grant you your heart's desire and give success to all your plans. May we rejoice in your victory and triumph in the name of our God. May God fulfill your every wish. Now I know, O God, that you help your anointed, and you will answer from your holy heaven and the victorious might of your right hand. Some put their trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of our God. They will totter and fall, but we shall rise and stand upright. God save those who rule and answer us when we call. Our Gospel lesson comes from Mark's Gospel. 
And Jesus is in the midst of telling many parables. He's just told the parable of the sower, sowing the seed. Depending on where it lands, it'll flourish or it'll die, carried off by birds or won't grow at all. He's interpreted this parable to the disciples in terms of the kingdom of God. And now he tells two more seed parables. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. And he does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our hymn, In the Bulb There is a Flower. That line about uh, cocoons and butterflies reminds me of a little a cartoon I just recently saw. An older sister explaining to her little brother, the caterpillar goes into the cocoon to quarantine, and when he comes out, he's a butterfly. We're all going to be butterflies soon. These passages this morning from Samuel and from Mark remind us that life is maybe not always as we expect it to be. God sees things differently than we see things. Um, give or take 10 years ago now, I was asked to be the guest speaker at the UCW's Quimelac weekend. And I decided, you know, being me, do something a little controversial perhaps, 
and I decided to do Bad Girls of the Bible as my theme. And the first time we got together, I looked out at this sea of women. I was one of a handful of women under 50 at that gathering. And I looked out to them and I said, I want you to tell me all the words that you've been taught or that you think of to describe a good girl. And they used words like obedient and quiet and meek and gentle. Those kinds of words. You probably have some running in your own head. And then I asked, all the words you've been taught or can think of to describe a bad girl. Bold, brash, outspoken, opinionated, strong, and I started to laugh. Maybe some of you are too, because they had described me as a bad girl because very few of those good girl words were words people would use to talk about me. Because I do tend to be a little outspoken, a little louder, and a little more brash than most of those good girls they were describing. We have notions that we're taught or that we have come to believe to be the way things are. And so, a good girl is someone who's quiet and soft-spoken and lets others take the lead. And those of us who are not, we're sometimes not put in the good girl pile. And yet, when I looked at those women that day, I said, but don't you want your daughters and granddaughters and nieces to, to be strong women, able to stand up for themselves? Does that make them bad? And then we talked about all of the women in the Bible they could think of, whether they define them as good or bad, and what made them that way. And then we truly got to the heart of each story and what God might have been trying to say through those women, where God was in their story, and discovered that maybe some of them weren't as bad as we thought they were. Although we did find a couple that we just really could never get into the good column, like Jezebel. We could find no redeeming qualities. But God looks at things different than we do. God looks at a small seed and makes a big plant from it. You can't tell by the size of a seed how big a plant's going to be. Now, I know that in Mark it says that this mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, and I'm pretty sure I've seen some smaller in our day and age. But a mustard seed is pretty tiny, and yet it makes this huge bush. Because there's something about what it needs to be that can be contained in that small seed. Samuel assumed a firstborn, a tall and handsome young man, would be the king. And God said, no, no, I don't look at that. Just wait, keep going till we get to the youngest son. Now in that day and age, youngest sons didn't really inherit anything. Especially when he was number eight on the list, there wasn't a whole lot left. But I always laugh when I read this passage because it starts out by saying, no, it's not Eliab because I don't just look at how tall and handsome he is. And then the description of David is about how handsome he is. But then God says, even if he's handsome, don't look like at that. Look beyond that. That's what I do. God shakes things up. God tells us to take more than one second to figure out who someone in front of you is. Samuel was looking, as was probably everybody else with him, in the same way. They all assumed it would be the oldest, the tallest, the most handsome. And God said, that's not how I think. 
Well, when we have people standing in front of us, what do we think? What do we use? Because like God, we can't see inside someone's heart right away. So we make assumptions based on what we've been taught or what we've experienced. Just like all those words that the ladies gave me that day that assumed certain things about what type of person you are. And we do that every day. It's kind of funny when you think about it, because if we would have seen somebody wearing a mask and coming into this bank or the grocery store previously, we would have assumed they were about to rob the place. And now, if someone comes in without a mask, we get upset and worried. Things have changed how we see things. The world has changed how we see things. Life has changed how we see things. God is always digging a little deeper because God wants us to be in relationship. God has great potential in each one of us in each of God's children throughout the world. And God wants the best for all of us. God wants us all to grow from our tiny seed into that huge mustard plant that can house birds and be a shelter and do something good. God wants all of us to stop looking at the oldest and the strongest and the tallest and the nicest looking and dig a little deeper. Get to know the person in front of you a little bit. I know I try to do that. And behind a mask, it gets really tricky to do so now because usually you start a conversation with a smile with a stranger. And nobody can see me smile these days. And so you nod at people that you think you know, or you just nod because you're not sure anymore. But you can still strike up a conversation. You can still find common ground. Because if there's one thing we all have in common right now is it that we're wearing those masks, we don't want to, and we're tired of it all. They have more in common, deep down inside, than we have in differences. God calls those things out in each one of us. God calls us to stop and take a moment to build a relationship to see maybe more of what God sees in each one of us. And yes, it takes some effort It's so much easier to just look and dismiss somebody or look and go, yeah, that's somebody I'd want to talk to. It takes a little longer. But God's telling us it's worth it. God's telling us not to assume that the seed is going to grow into something in particular, but to watch and see what actually grows. For we are part of the kingdom of God. And God is calling each one of us to look inside, not just ourselves, but to look deeper into one another and find the good that God has placed in each one of us so that together we can grow into a healthy plant, a healthy nation, a healthy world that gives shelter, and care, and connection to all. Amen. Pentecost is the season in which we remember the coming of the Holy Spirit, a spirit that enlivens, encourages, and inspires us. When we let the Spirit work in us and through us, we find gratitude and service coming to the fore. The Spirit is the reason we give of time, talent, and treasure. For the Spirit reminds us that we have life from God, and we have it in abundance. So we give.
Let us pray. Please take what we offer this day, O God, whether we are caring for family and friends from a distance, finding ways to serve safely in person, or praying for the chance to do more. Take what we can give this day and every day. Amen. And now as we bring the prayers of our hearts, we pray for our whole world. We pray for those that have been named before service. And we come and we lay it all before God. Let us pray. God, we share your concern for the world you created, for you continue to work within creation through us. Your spirit helps your love take root and produce fruit in unlikely places through unlikely people. What we may sow, even unintentionally, may lead to the wonders and accomplishments made by another. We are both seeds and sowers as we seek to be your faithful people in the world. You help us to grow and flourish. In turn, we are able to assist others to do the same. For all this, we thank you. God, our true friend, assist our prayers. Let them echo your love for the earth and all that is in it. We begin our prayers for others by asking your presence to be with those who live with us in this church community. Keep the strong, gentle, empower the weak. Make us all more merciful. Comfort those grieving a loss. Heal those recovering from illness. Guide those facing tough decisions. And make us all just a little more patient. Keep the clever wise. Forgive and straighten out the foolish. Endow the meek with confidence. And make us all the true children of your love. We pray also for our wider community and nation. Guide our leaders. Forgive their blunders. Humble their pride. Work with their strengths. Divert them from grave errors and turn even their weaknesses to good use. Within our country, we are still being reminded that we need to pray especially for those still affected by the errors of the past from residential schools. And pray for those who choose hate over love or tolerance and are deadly to others. And then we pray for those who have been affected as happened in London most recently. We ask you to bless our world by using us and all other people who love justice and compassion, heal the pain of the nations, relieve the oppressed, feed the hungry, stand with those enduring warfare, bless your peacemakers, house the homeless, Provide a welcoming place for refugees and bless any politician who trusts you more than their own prejudice or fear. In these difficult, trying, uncertain times, we also pray for ourselves. Where we are strong in faith, use us sensitively. Where we are weak in faith, help us to believe more daringly. Where we are weak in body, Give us delight in the strengths we do have. Where we have abundant energy, let us employ it generously. Where we are large in compassion, enable us to use it efficiently. Where we are surrounded by many possessions, help us to give more freely. Where we must live more frugally, let us embrace the special blessings that you have promised to the poor. Hear now the prayers of our hearts for others and for ourselves.
God of new creation, let us live as those who really are the reborn creatures of your realm of grace. To your praise and your glory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. As we go, remember, God's Spirit rests in you. Look for God's Spirit in each one you meet. Seek their uniqueness that is a gift to others. Let their spirit speak to your spirit, for that is where love speaks loudest. And may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, the Holy Spirit keep each one of you, now and always. Amen.
And I invite you, as you are willing and able, to unmute your microphones so that the people may together say, Hallelujah and Amen. Woo! <laughs> that was great, Mary yeah. Jane.